<laughs> there we go. All right, a picture description or imitation of a person in which certain striking characteristics. This is a long one. Are exaggerated. In order to create a comic or grotesque effect. Long definition. So, has anybody had their caricature done? You, mm -hmm. you? How happy were you with the results? Made me happy. You loved it, Lena? <laughs> yeah. Lucy, not so much. Why not so much? Well, um, when I got it done, I was very insecure about my nose and in face. And that was one thing that they decided to try. Yes. You have to be so brave to get one of those things done. Like, um, often usually when it's little girls or teenage girls and they're doing it like they know that teenage girls we need to be more careful um so or my they when, go. or they go the other way yeah but mine i was like so happy with it because i have like very uh, this is being dumbly critical but i have like kind of small eyes for my face and they made my eyes like Emma Stone, like gorgeous, like the lashes were like so great. And I was like, yes, I'm happy with this. This is the, the characteristic that I want exaggerated, right? But my husband, same way when they did his caricature, they honestly, so it was, um, my husband is not Jewish, but he has kind of Jewish features. He has like, um, you know, an Afro and he's got kind of a prominent nose and they exaggerated all those parts of him to, to a level that like we had to throw it away. We were like, this looks like, like Nazi propaganda. We cannot keep this in the house. It was insane. So it was like, they pulled out things that like they identified in him that kind of weren't actually there and made assumptions about him and it was it created this kind of grotesque effect but lena why'd you like yours oh awesome so it was a good like memento right yeah james i'm gonna be completely honest i haven't had a character character yeah so to speak but my dad has this friend who's a cartoonist and when i was like seven he did a picture Oh, so that could kind of that could be a caricature where their features exaggerated in oh, you. No. Oh, it no. just was you kind of as a cartoon. If anybody knows who Ari Vanderbilt is, I don't. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I was at my mom's wedding, and I think the wedding character artists make you seem a lot like better. Because <laughs> it's like it's a romantic occasion. It's yeah. nice. I yeah. Oh right. <laughs> and like we all look so good. It's like wow, we look so good. We're such a beautiful family. I love that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um okay, that's a great example actually, because <laughs> Stop me if I'm wrong, but were you a little bit chatty when you were getting your caricature done? No, I didn't like No? Were you sneering at him? No, I just, I, I'm scared of him because I was like six. Oh, oh, bummer. Okay, well, I was kind of basing it on the thing that I know now. And I think that part of a caricature is like exaggerating the features that should be associated with that person's personality, not necessarily with their like features. So I'm like, yeah. Dane has a big mouth. Perfect. You know, exaggerate that part of it. <laughs> yeah, Cameron. <laughs> yeah. I have a very upset. Kind of like grumpy cat. <laughs> that's, great. that's another good example. Yeah, to capture the personality. Oh. <laughs> okay, this is a bit of an awkward transition. I'm sorry, but uh, caricatures are mostly used for comic effects. They're mostly like lovable, right? Um, we though are going to talk about an evil kind of caricature, which is a popular form of entertainment from the 
1800s into the early 1900s, which is a menstrual show. So under example, I want you to write down menstrual shows. And I'm going to show you a movie. We're watching about eight minutes of it. So we are kind of watching a movie. Um, I'm going to show you a clip that explains what these shows were like. Those are more vaudeville shows. Um, yeah. A menstrual show, so just to give you a bit of a, an intro to this, a menstrual show is when usually, it was usually white actors, occasionally black actors, but like 90% of the time it was white actors who would use like um, grease paint to uh, put black face on. They would exaggerate their features and then they would uh, perform in like a way that was like comic um, to show kind of like how ridiculous black people are. And this is an extremely popular form of entertainment. And the reason I'm telling you about it is because Mark Twain loved these shows. What? Um, he was a big fan. Yeah, which is really uh, troubling. So, but, so yeah, let's cancel Mark Twain. <laughs> Melodrama was big everywhere, but only America decided to link melodrama and the minstrel show. And this gets us Uncle Tom's- Oh, sorry, that's the end. Adaptation. Hey there, I'm Mike Panetta. This is Crash Course Theater, and today we're continuing our discussion of 19th century American- setting <laughs> parts of our theatrical past. In the 19th century, race and racism contributed to a unique and troubling- Sorry! <laughs> Okay, so um, this is a side note. That's one of the reasons that when people dress in blackface or when we find out that, you know, politicians have a history of them dressing up in blackface for a Halloween party, that's where that idea that it is extremely offensive kind of derives from. There's, there, it's more complicated maybe than that about the way that people have used blackface like more currently, but part of the reason that that is so offensive is because of the history of blackface and these menstrual shows. So like I said, Mark Twain was a fan of this style of performance. Um, he has, the, we have evidence of him saying, I went to the menstrual show, I enjoyed it, uh, good time, I loved it, you know, like this was, this was great fun. So when we think about how he portrays Jim in this book, that becomes like, really troubling, you know? We're thinking about, well, what kind of like human characteristics did Mark Twain actually believe that African-Americans had if he was like a fan of these kinds of shows? So let's look at a couple spots in this book where Jim has some big moments. So go to page five. Yes, I'm just over here in this box. Just page five. All right, so they have, Tom and Huck have tied up Jim um, as a prank, just because it seems like a fun thing to do. And Tom uh, gets some candles and lays five cents on the table. This is the top of page five. Then when we got out, he was in a sweat to get away, but nothing would do Tom, but he must crawl to where Jim was on his hands and knees and play something on him. I waited and it seemed a good while. Everything was so still and lonesome. It says, as soon as Tom was back, we cut along the path around the garden. This is what I wanted, yeah. Around the garden fence and by and by fetched up on the steep top of the hill, the other side of the house. Tom said he slipped Jim's hat off of his head and hung it up on a limb right over him. And Jim stirred a little, but he didn't wait. 
Afterwards, Jim said the witches bewitched him and put him in a trance and rode him all over the state and then set him under the trees again and hung his hat on a limb to show who'd done it. And, uh, and next time Jim told it, he said they rode him down to New Orleans. And after that, every time he told it, he spread it more and more till by and by, he said they rode him all over the world and tired him most to death and his back was all over saddle boils. Jim was monstrous proud of it and he got so he wouldn't hardly notice the other N-words. Okay, so this is a moment in the book that has troubled a lot of people where they're thinking, oh, this is very presenting a black man in a very stereotypical way. One of the stereotypes from this time period is that black people are extremely superstitious and that that superstition comes from like kind of their lack of Christianity. Like it was like, oh, of course they're gonna believe in like all of these sort of witches and ghosts and so on because they don't have God in their lives. So they don't have Sunday school in their lives. Um, what do you think of that little portrayal right there how does that fit in this little section with this idea that Mark Twain is portraying Jim very stereotypically? Yeah, really. Yeah. Yes. Right. And what's your experience of the world? Yeah, like, yeah right. You would normally think that, like, authors said, you're going to write about, let's say, you know, people were actually Right. <laughs> Okay, good. So, um, yes, I think, so Mark Twain grows up in the South, he would have known Black people, but I think that you're right that this sort of, this sort of comes not from the Black lived experience, but it comes from his sort of understanding of caricatures that he's seen. He's representing Jim as one of those caricatures. Bradley. I mean, this feels a lot like reading it as a satire to a degree. Yeah. Especially because this isn't necessarily more Mark Twain portraying how Huck sees Jim. Yes, that's really important here. And like while he lived in a time where that was just <coughs> everyone knew him because there was like bad news and everyone was into that and he didn't but I mean he didn't have like any like racist intention with this mm. in any way. Mm. Okay. And how people, some people get really on Robert Downey Jr. saying he is blackface. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I was playing a white character and that character was me. Yeah, which is a really important distinction, right? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't question whether or not it's appropriateness, right? But there's satire of the racism there. Yeah, okay, let's keep reading because I think that it starts to get into that. It says, N-words would come from Miles to hear Jim tell about it, and he was more looked up to than any in that country. Strange, N-words would stand with their mouths open and look him all over, same as if he was a wonder. They were always talking about witches in the dark by the kitchen fire, but whenever one was talking and letting on to know about all, all about such things, Jim's would, Jim would happen and Ah, sorry, happen in and say, hmm, what do you know about witches? And that N-word was corked up and had to take a back seat. Jim always kept that five center piece around his neck with a string and said it was a charm the devil gave to him with his own hands and told him he could cure anybody with it and fetch witches whenever he wanted to just by saying something to it. But he never told what it was he said to it. Uh, they would come from all around there and give Jim anything they had just for a side of that five centerpiece, but they wouldn't touch it because the devil had had his hands on it. Jim was most ruined for a servant because he got stuck up on account of having seen the devil and been rode by witches. Okay, I think that co complicates it a bit. 
Um, and I am not disagreeing with Riley here. I'm also not disagreeing with Bradley. That's why it's like so, it's kind of confusing to me in this section. But what is the use of Jim's superstition in this section? Like what use does he get out of being superstitious? Yeah. That the fame. fame. Yeah. So everybody around is like, oh my gosh, there goes Jim, the guy who like the witches chose to be, you know, <laughs> their chosen one or whatever. And I want to interact with Jim more. So he gets a little bit of popularity from it. But does he get anything else from it? Stuff that people get there. Stuff. Yeah. So it's they'll give anything they had just for a side of that five centerpiece. So he's using it for his economic benefit. He's like, oh yeah, witches, witches came and they they took me around. Do you want to see the five cent piece that they gave me? And then everybody is paying for a chance to see it. So the question is, is Jim actually superstitious? Or is Jim playing into that stereotype of being superstitious because that's how he's going to get economic gain? And what's so what's interesting is this this happens um, before a really major event in in film history that feels very similar to this. Have you guys seen Gone with the Wind? So th there's a character in Gone with the Wind, her, played by Hattie McDonald. Um, McDaniels, sorry, Hattie McDaniels, who is like a mammy stereotype. This is a stereotype that comes from these minstrel shows. It was like the kind of overweight, matronly, like motherly black woman who just wants to care for all the little white children. And she was like, you know, a good cook and sang great songs and so on. And it's a stereotype, right? Yeah. And Hattie McDaniels was one of those black actresses who decided I'm going to per perform in minstrel shows so that I can like make that money off that stereotype, right? Um, so in some ways it's like, good for you, Hattie McDaniels. Like if that's the way that you're going to get rich and she did get, she got some prosperity from this, like then that was like, you know, what you gotta do, right? At the same time, then she's cast in this movie Gone with the Wind produced by white people, you know, may line the pockets of white people, and she's playing that stereotype in that role. So I think Jim is kind of working that way too. It's like, I'm, I'm a slave. I don't have a chance to make money on my own that often. I know what people expect of me. And you can tell that he doesn't fully believe it because of the way that it exaggerates as it goes. It's like, oh, it just started around town. Now it's New Orleans. Now it's around the world. Um, you can tell that like he's exaggerating kind of on purpose. Um, and he's leaning into that stereotype. That doesn't make it not offensive because here's Twain now using that stereotype for his character, but it it's, makes it more interesting. Lucy? Um, Yes, it, it not even borderline really. Well, yeah, borderline because they don't use the exaggerated makeup. Yeah. But um, the idea of like a happy slave on the plantation who just like loves being there because they love the white children, it's definitely part of it from that minstrel show tradition. Yeah. I mean, I feel like even though it might like, you know, portray Jim as not superstitious, he still portrays all of the other slaves yes. with that. So Great point. Like, kind of, I can see that. It's like, of like, it's making that point, but it still hasn't, like, you know, really dismantled that stereotype. Absolutely. Off of that stereotype. Yeah, if you really wanted to dismantle the stereotype, it'd be white people that were coming to see the five cent piece, right? And get kind of getting taken advantage of that way. Yeah, right. 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 He's not actually creating this system. Yeah, it's Twain that's doing it for him. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In a way, it's almost like we're not paying taxes. In a way, it acts as a Yes. Absolutely. I think I don't even think that that's like. Uh, that far off of, of analogy, I think that's exactly what it is because we saw how in a minstrel show it it like was often black actors that were dressing up in minstrel show like attire too, right? Um, yeah, I think it was a good analogy, city. Yeah. 
Yes. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that goes along with what they were saying too. Okay, good. Here's let's look at another moment. Let's look on page 208. We're going to skip all the way to the end. <laughs> okay, this is when the boys are making him go through, jump through all these hoops to achieve his freedom. Um, and they want him to have rattlesnakes and spiders because that's what you should have in a prison. Um, and so on 208, in the middle of the page, uh, he says, Tom says, you got any spiders in here, Jim? And Jim says, no, sir, thanks to goodness I, I have it, Master Tom. All right, we'll get you some. <laughs> but bless you, honey, I don't want none. Um, I'm, af I'm afraid of them. I'm just gonna read it the way I can. I just as soon as have a rattles I just as soon as have rattlesnakes around. And Tom thought a good minute or two and says, it's a good idea. And I reckon it's been done. It must have been done. It stands to reason. Yes, that's a prime good idea. Where could you keep it? Keep what, Master Tom? Why, a rattlesnake. Uh, goodness gracious alive, Master Tom. Why, if there was a rattlesnake to come in here, I'd take and bust right out through that log wall I would with my head. Why, Jim, you wouldn't be afraid of it after a little. You could tame it. Tame it? Yes, easy enough. Every animal is grateful for kindness and petting, and they wouldn't think of hurting a person that pets them. Tom is so, Tom is so dumb. <laughs> yeah, he's very book smart, but not uh, not so life no, smart. We call Tom book smart and then have him so yeah, have him too much dumb. <laughs> he yeah, has no intelligence in that. He has read a lot of fantasy books where princesses put out their hands and birds alight on their hands, you know, like there's this romanticized no, version of the world. It's funny because he says rattlesnake, which is completely different from a bird. Yes, true. He has he has <laughs> made that. <laughs> He's a bad, yeah, it's like he reads a lot, but he's a really bad reader. He doesn't understand how it should be applied to his actual life. Yes. But he does say, any book will tell you that. <laughs> you try. <laughs> You try, that's all I ask. Just try for two or three days. Why, you can get him so in a little while that he'll love you and sleep with you and won't stay away from you a minute and will let you wrap him around your neck and put his head in your mouth. And Jim says, please, Master Tom, don't talk so. I can't stand it. He'd let me shove his head in my mouth for a favor, uh, having it. I lay he'd wait a powerful long time before I asked him any more than that. I don't, and more than that, I don't want him to sleep with me. Okay, so here is Jim like pushing it back against these two little white boys, right? Why doesn't he just like hit them? Like he's so much bigger than them. Why doesn't he just like knock them aside and say, look, the door is unlocked, I'm leaving. Yeah, Megan. They might freak out. Yes. And I think they of like if I do any harm and someone's here like if I show if even if you like had just shoved them aside like that could be just the worst of what people would say was like oh we beat him over the head with a stick right. and then right. he's just screwed so he's trying to make sense of these little white boys but yeah there is a huge power dynamic here right and Jim has to play along with that power dynamic Ammon how often these um like right right that's the other thing here is even though these kids are being mean they're being mean in a very kid-like way and um over the course of this book whatever we think about this jim has taken on this role of father figure to huck he has you know he has started and we, we read about this last time him huck thinking back to all of the things that jim has done to care for him like how he's protected him how he's taken on the watch so that huck can sleep like jim does have an investment in huck as like a kid he wants huck to be okay you know so part of it might be like okay i'll play along with them because this is you know this is sort of for 
for Huck's benefit. I don't know what else Huck could do. I don't think Jim has that relationship to Tom in any way, but I think he has to appease Tom because Tom is Huck's friend. It goes on. So look at the bottom of page 209 now. And he says, um, that's the thing that'll scoop, a, he's talking about taming the animals and he's talking about playing music to the animals. And it says, that's the thing that'll scoop a rat quicker than anything else. And when you've played about two minutes, you'll see all the rats and snakes and the spiders and things begin to feel worried about you and come. And they'll just barely swarm over you and have a noble time. And Jim says, this is the sentence I want to think about the most. Yes, they will, I reckon, Master Tom. But what kind of time is Jim having? <laughs> It's such a good line. They're like, you'll have a great time. Like there will be all of these animals around you. And like, it's so fun to play prison, you know? And Jim responds to, yeah, but what kind of time am I having? What do you think he's doing there? How does that show like some of Jim's character? Maybe in a way that we haven't gotten so much in this book as, as, as much. Yeah, Lucy. I mean, that's definitely something that Yeah. Yes, it's really, um, it does not come like immediately to us to feel empathy. Yeah, some little kids are more empathetic than others. Like there are definitely little, little kids that if you cry in front of them, they crawl up on your lap and you're like, why are you crying? You know, but I don't know, my nephew's not like that. If you pretend cry, he like laughs at you and runs away. You know, it doesn't come, it's not something that we're just born with. It's something that we learn to have. And it comes over time. They, they don't think we have full capacity for full empathy until we're in our twenties even. Um, so for him to sit back and say like, hey, I need to teach you how to think about other people, I think is that fatherly moment there too, yeah. And Jim asserts himself. He's like, hey, I have to go along with this maybe because of power structures, but like, let's pause for a second and like, consider me as a human, please, white boys. You know, so he actually does get to speak up in this moment. It's really rare for him to do that, but he does it here. Okay, there's one more mo mo uh, moment I wanna look at. It's the last page, 232. Actually, go to 231. Yes, chapter the last. All right, Jim is out of chains. Um, he's set free, not out of anyone's goodness of, well, anyway, moving on. Jim is free at this point, though. And at the bottom of the page, um, they're worried about Huck's pap and Huck says it's likely pap's been out before now and got it all away from Judge Satcher and drunk it up. He's talking about his inheritance. He has the six thousand dollars, which again is like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in our in our money. Um, and he's like, yeah, my dad's probably drunk all of that by now. And Tom says, no, he hadn't. It's all there yet. Six thousand dollars and more. And your pap ain't, ain't never been back since. Hadn't when I come away anyhow. And Jim says, kind of solemn. He ain't a coming back no more, Huck. And I says, why, Jim? Never mind why, Huck, but he ain't coming back no more. But I kept at him. So at last he says, don't you remember the house that was floating down the river? And there was a man in there, uh, covered up. And I went in and, un oh, it's covered, sorry. And uncovered him and didn't let you come in. Well, then you can get your money when you want it because that was him. So this whole time going down the road, this is a very early thing that happens. They haven't even left Jackson Island yet. A house kind of floats ashore and inside that house is Huck's, is a dead body. And Jim says, don't look at it, Huck. And we feel like he's, you know, protecting Huck from seeing a dead body, this little kid. I don't want you to have to see something so grotesque, right? But at the end, we find out it was even more than that. It was Huck's dad. Why do you think Jim didn't tell Huck? Yeah, Lucy. Okay, super traumatizing. You've seen your dead body. I don't want to traumatize this kid. Ammon? Um, I feel like it's almost kind of running away from that. I mean, I know how to run away from society, but he's more running away from his dad. Without his dad, he could have lived in that life and kind of gone away for a little bit and did fine. So I almost feel like it kind of like only really happened to like plot armor, you know? Yeah. Like just to keep the plot going or like maybe like 
if you feel like you're someone's body politic, you're maybe sort of selfish to not like let them know that their relative passed away mm -hmm. and you're safe and you can go back to life and you don't have to go through this hard, like painful journey down a river to, you know, you know what I mean? Almost yeah. Seems like Okay, so maybe Jim was Jim selfish on Jim's part not to tell him because Huck maybe didn't have to go on this giant adventure. But you also started out with like he could have gone back to living with Aunt Polly and, and Miss Watson and he wasn't super happy there either. So potentially there maybe is, is something not altruistic, but like not as selfish because he knew that Huck didn't have the best life. <laughs> maybe? Sadie? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, because um, Huck could have gone back to shore at that point. Yeah. yeah like I think if he had said that he had dad died, like he would have just left him. Like, oh, see ya. Or like, but Jim wouldn't know that. Like the beginning, but Jim wouldn't know that. Right. Right. Okay. And they hadn't formed that connection yet. Huck was just a little white boy that uh, lived with the person who owned me. Why should I trust him? Um. was needed <coughs> by Jim for something to do it. He probably just wanted someone to help him. And he <laughs> I mean partially it's, yeah okay like, so Jim wanted so he, did, he, had, he did and he wanted to be like a scholar figure at the end of the day. And so he tells us that he has a father who died for him. The one who probably knew that yeah good good and think about how he needed huck like how often it's huck who goes ashore and jim who stays behind because jim is a runaway slave is not safe to go to shore ever so huck can be the one to find information he can be the one to like get supplies so on megan and then go ahead. So we go back to what Lucy started us with, like that's a very traumatizing thing for him to have to experience. Jim probably knows what a like terrible person Huck's dad is. So why expose him to that trauma? Zoe? Um, so kind of building off that, it didn't feel like malicious or selfish to me. Mm -hmm. uh, one reason is because at the end of the book, even once he was free and he was there, um, he still didn't tell Huck until like he kept asking him again. I think one thing that might have helped that was that we we can talk about the young kids and how they can integrate this is probably the same way as Huck. And I think there was a bit of a father figure in there for him that mm -hmm. even though he was a kid, he was also seeing Huck as the same age and the way he felt about him. Yeah, that's a wonderful way of thinking about that. That like he actually he already was a father and he wasn't having the opportunity to father and this is his opportunity to have that connection. Um, um I feel like maybe Jim was protecting him from the same way that he was because it's not always the easiest for someone to love or do well yeah. to die. Yeah. So maybe Jim should have protected that from the same way. Yeah, yes, good, good. Um even if it is an abusive figure, like it's still his dad, right? Okay, there are many moments in this book where Jim exerts agency in this way. So even though we get it from Huck's perspective, and you guys rightly challenged me last time, like Jim's not the hero of this book, right? Um, there are ways that Jim filtered through a racist kid because of society, like sort of like 
um, I shouldn't say a racist kid because he's fighting it so hard and at his core, maybe not, but um, a kid who exists, a white kid in a, a slave system, right? Um, he, we get it filtered through his perspective, but Jim shines through often in this book. Like he kind of like, he forces his way into it by saying like, no, I made decisions all along. In fact, I made the biggest decision that kind of got us going on this journey. I ran away to freedom, right? And that, then I didn't tell you that your dad was in that cabin and I could have, you know, I could have been caught that way. So I'm exerting my agency. So I'm not saying it's not racist and I'm not saying it is racist. I'm just saying it's, it's quite complicated. So we're going to read a piece of criticism now from someone who loves this book that you wouldn't expect to love this book. So her name is Toni Morrison. Have you heard of this writer, Toni Morrison? She won all the prizes. Um, she is responsible. She wrote a book called Beloved that many people say that was the great American novel. Um, and she kind of became like, the black voice in literature, um, where whenever a book would come out about the black experience, you'd go to Toni Morrison and say, well, what do you think about it? Um, she's really intelligent. She writes in a way that is not going to be the easiest reading, but I still want us to work through this essay that she wrote. I think it's really important to understand why people like this book, why they think it's this classic. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna have you do, this is your copy, you can write all over it. I'm gonna have you reading her essay. It's, it's long, you're gonna read it quietly to yourself. And then I'm gonna have some questions up on the projector here in a second that I'm gonna have you answering once you get done reading this essay. Um, your goal here is to figure out why does Toni Morrison think that this book deserves to be read? So as somebody, she's, um, she's a Black woman who is a very prominent voice in literature, who is always looking to uh, make the, basically like, we talked about the Western canon and how you know, it tends to be written by old white men. Toni Morrison, it was like her life project to upset that. Like, let's find voices like her name, like other voices from the past that wrote literature that are not, you know, old white men. Here is this woman who is like really values diversity in literature and she's talking about how she loves Huckleberry Finn. So read this and I'll put up the question and you'll just answer the questions uh, in the blank space that she got on the, on the back of the screen. When you're done reading, there's three questions up here. I know a lot of you are still reading, that's totally fine. When you're done reading, there's three questions up here. It says each question should be at least five complete sentences to answer. Um, if it's, you know, don't make your sentences short and dumb to reach that five. I'm just trying to get you to be thorough with your answers. So answer these three questions in that blank spot on the purple page. If you need more paper, you can use more paper. We'll staple it.
Yeah. Why are we sad? I mean, you're doing it anyway. I'm just going to give you points for doing it. Oh, well, show it to me. I'll take a picture. Yeah, just for like kind of figure it out and show you it's not my acting up. Yeah, I can do that. It looks like most people have started working on the questions now. So I'm going to let you, if you want to, work in pairs on this. Um, you'll both need to turn it in, but I understand that the essay is uh, quite difficult sometimes to figure out what she's talking about. So it's okay if you want to collaborate to figure out what the answers are to these three questions.
to be called empties. Which is oh, it's not. No, I just <laughs> you tried to type it. Oh, it would have been better. Type. Why don't you just type your answers and send it to me? Yeah, that's fine. I didn't even think to do it that way. Too old. Humble brag. <laughs> I'm too why, smart to answer these why, questions. Why the time my hands like writing it like I'm already like. Mm -hmm. Oh, so is that why typing better? Yeah. Oh. Well, you can type it. Are you ever you ever writing something by hand and you, you know exactly where it's going, and then you get a super good idea, but you can't remember what you're thinking to lead up to that idea. You're not there yet. Yeah, then you still have to write it out. Do you ever record yourself talking on your phone so that you can I avoid that? that? I do yeah, that. So no, I, well, I admittedly, I, I do that in the coffee for this. I think, wow, I see her horrible. No, no, no. You're like, I thought. Oh, right? your voice. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
just in uh, our box, which is seventh, yeah. Perfect. Yep. I'll double check, make sure I don't. Great. Okay. <laughs> All right, Ammon, I got it. And Megan, I got yours. Great. Okay, I am going to put this screen up again here in a second. I want to show you what our Huck Finn assignment is going to be. Sorry. Pull it up without showing all your emails. Okay, so along the way, you have little small assignments. You're going to be writing another paragraph for next time, just one paragraph. But on January 20, no, 19th for you guys, um, there is an essay that you're going to be writing about Huckleberry Finn. Of course, there is. There's always an essay, right? Um, and what you're doing in this essay, we're going to be working on this in class and building this. Um, but what you're doing is you're going to talk about one aspect of Huck Finn that you think makes it great. Or if you don't think this is great literature, what is one aspect from this book that is great? So I'm kind of forcing you to advocate for this book. I know that that's uh, not something everyone wants to do, but I want us to see why this has been considered such an important book and so for the next couple of class periods we're going to be reading more essays like morrison's not as long as morrison but we're going to be reading about these writers who are defending huck finn and it always does feel like a defense not quite a celebration but a defense and so we're going to be reading some of that and you're going to be eventually writing about one of these things that makes this book great so I want you to just be aware of that because it'll it'll come up faster than you want it to. And here are the questions again. We only have two more minutes of class. I'm going to make you turn it in at the end. So get as far as you can. <laughs> Oh, a minute early. Is I, get it. I know, but I think it's because 
the teachers that stick to the rules then like their students get mad at them because they're going to be lost in lunch line or whatever so i wrote about this piece of paper perfect well, yes. the question too is that all right uh yes put it in the drawer like okay. this that's right okay. i'll see that you try <laughs> yeah <laughs> Although she does mention that, but it's this idea then that they're doomed based on her own experience. She's like, oh, black and white friendships feel oh, doomed yeah, in this yeah. way. So it's like, even from the very beginning, I know there's not going to be a happy ending the way I want that happy ending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's the way that she would think about it that someone else would. Yes. They were reading it. Like, yep. I didn't even think about that. I no. Like, their, their friendship was doomed. No, and I don't feel that necessarily that sense of unease.